In this unit, we're going to dig into nuclear magnetic resonance, or NMR spectroscopy. And this is, without question, the most powerful analytical technique that you'll come across in introductory organic chemistry. From an NMR spectrum alone, we can often go from a molecular formula all the way to a molecular structure, a pretty good educated guess of the structure of the molecule. And so we're going to learn how to interpret NMR spectra, going from a spectrum to a structure, how to infer a spectrum from a structure, something we've gotten so good at that computers can do it for us, as we'll see. And we'll learn how to integrate NMR with the analytical methods we've previously seen for structure elucidation, infrared spectroscopy, and mass spectrometry. There is a little bit of underlying physics with NMR that we need to understand in order to appreciate how we interpret NMR spectra. And so we're going to start by describing the general characteristics of the NMR experiment and the physical principles upon which NMR is based, just enough that we're able to meaningfully interpret NMR spectra. There are four key features of NMR spectra that we want to pay attention to from a structure elucidation point of view. The number of distinct signals, where they appear on the x-axis, this is known as chemical shift, the area under each signal, which is known as the integration, and the pattern of sub-peaks within the si signal, which is called the multiplicity. And this pattern of sub-peaks is highly unique to NMR, and it gives us a ton of information about how atoms are connected to each other, particularly in proton NMR. We'll learn how to relate chemical shift to electron density around carbons and hydrogens in molecular structures, and in this way, we'll learn to recognize specific functional groups within a compound based on the positions of their signals in NMR spectra along the x-axis, which is again this idea of chemical shift. And then we're going to learn how to take a molecular structure and generate an educated guess about the nature of its proton NMR spectrum. I'll also show you an online tool that can do this for you. You build the structure and it will spit out an educated guess of the NMR spectrum that you can compare to your predictions. We're also going to discuss carbon NMR, which uses the carbon-13 nucleus as its basics. It's a little bit less informative than proton NMR, but it's still going to give us some useful structural information. We'll talk about the limitations of carbon NMR, what you can expect to get out of it, and how to interpret a, a carbon-13 NMR spectrum. And we're going to compare and contrast proton and carbon NMR to look at similarities and differences. And then finally, we're going to learn how to go from a proton NMR spectrum to an educated guess of the molecular structure using these characteristics in LO2, number of signals, their chemical shifts, their integration, and their coupling pattern or multiplicity to generate an educated guess of molecular structure. We'll also see in the next unit how we can bring all of these pieces of information together to generate an educated guess from the molecular structure and organic compound from infrared, mass spec, and NMR data. Let's start just by talking about what nuclear magnetic resonance is. Nuclear magnetic resonance has to do with how matter interacts with magnetism and radio waves. Nuclear spins exist in certain nuclei that respond to magnetic fields and radio waves, and some of the nuclei that do this are listed on this slide. The most important for our purposes are the first two. The proton, which we list as 1H, and carbon-13, which is a minor isotope of carbon, it's not the major isotope, which is carbon-12, but it's there in a detectable amount, about 1.1%. As we previously saw in discussions of mass spec, fluorine and phosphorus NMR are also possible and relatively common in the research world, but not something you're likely to encounter in an introductory organic course. The basis of NMR is that these nuclei act like tiny magnets themselves. They have an intrinsic what's called nuclear spin, which is a very much quantum phenomenon that classically we can imagine as a magnetic dipole, as a little magnet. And you see a representation of this down here. We can think of the proton itself as having a north pole and a south pole, just like a magnet. And when we apply an external magnetic field, which we're going to represent throughout this unit as B0, to a sample of protons, they can align themselves either parallel to the field, like this, or anti-parallel to the field, like you see here. 
And there's an energy difference between these two spin states. There's an energy difference between what we'll call the parallel spin state, that's also referred to as alpha, and the anti-parallel spin state, which is referred to as beta. Now that energy difference can be probed by light, right? We've seen how light can cause excitations from a lower energy to a higher energy state, right? And as it turns out, when it comes to NMR, the right frequency range for this light is in the radio frequency region of the spectrum. So delta E is in this radio frequency region, and the essence of NMR really is measuring this delta E using radio waves impinging on a sample with these NMR active nuclei. And again, the two most important are protons and carbon carbons, carbon 13s, for um, organic chemistry, right? This is going to give us great information into the electronic environments of hydrogens in organic molecules and carbons as well. Now to show you classically how NMR works, I wanted to take a look at this simulation, thinking of the NMR active nucleus as a kind of compass needle. This is actually going to give us great insight into the basic idea of how NMR works. So let me jump over the simulation here and show you what's going on. So we have a compass needle here that's analogous to a nucleus, an NMR active nucleus. Just like an NMR active nucleus, it's got a magnetic dipole, a north end and a south end. And what you can see here is we've got an external magnetic field B0, the south pole is at the top, the north pole is at the bottom, and our magnetic moment is aligned with the north pole closer to the south pole of the external magnetic field and vice versa, right? So this is aligned as we'd expect for a magnet with the opposite poles closer to each other and attracted to each other. Now here, nothing's happening, right? The compass needle is just aligned as normal. But if I add a coil here that creates a magnetic field in the horizontal direction, something interesting starts to happen when I crank that magnetic field and then change this frequency. What happens is we can see this horizontal magnetic field pushing on the compass needle and creating an oscillation. And this oscillation is detectable if you watch the magnetic field in the horizontal direction due to the compass needle. So what we can then do is turn off this magnetic field and watch what happens as our compass needle returns back to equilibrium, back to straight up. We see these oscillations. The frequencies of those oscillations are the NMR phenomenon, and this is exactly what we measure on an NMR spectrum. The different frequencies that protons and organic molecules exhibit when they're left made to oscillate like this and then allowed to relax back down. So in the simulation, we had that vertical magnetic field. That's what we've called B0, kind of the vertical external magnetic field. And we've got this horizontal or transverse field that gets that compass needle oscillating. Something very similar occurs in an actual NMR experiment, it's just that the compass needle is now an NMR active nucleus. But just like we saw in this simulation, there's a detector that is perpendicular to the B0 field, which is running in this direction, that detects these oscillations, and we measure those oscillations. We'll see that this is actually the output of the NMR experiment. That gets trans translated into a frequency spectrum through a mathematical operation known as the Fourier transform, and that's what we actually look at as the NMR spectrum. Now, this oscillation at a specific frequency is what we know as magnetic resonance, and it only occurs when the frequency of oscillations in that horizontal direction matches the natural, what's called precession frequency of the nucleus, or in the simulation, of the compass needle. So we're going to use this term precession frequency to refer to kind of the, the natural oscillating frequency, and that's associated with this energy gap. If we back up here, there's an energy gap here between the alpha and beta spin states. That's associated with a delta E, and that delta E is associated with a frequency nu via the equation delta E equals H new, right? That frequency is the precession frequency of the nucleus, and it's also the frequency of the radio wave light that causes an excitation from the alpha to the beta state. And it's the frequency that we measure in the NMR experiment. Now, if all nuclei were exactly the same, if all protons were exactly the same, then proton NMR wouldn't tell us much, right? Because every hydrogen in a sample would um, 
have the same frequency and we just get one big peak somewhere in the middle of the NMR spectrum. The beauty of NMR is that the electron density around a proton affects its precession frequency because electrons also have a magnetic moment and they do something that's sort of Le Chatelier's principle-esque in that when we apply an external magnetic field to the electron, it moves to create a countering magnetic field. We could call that B sub E. And what the nucleus actually feels is the difference between that external magnetic field and the electron's countering magnetic field. And more or less, the greater the electron density around the nucleus, the smaller the effective field felt by the nuclei. Nuclei with high electron density around them, we call these shielded. High electron density around the nucleus means I get a big countering magnetic field from those electrons, and the effective magnetic field felt by the nucleus is relatively small. On the other hand, around nuclei with low electron density, around protons with low electron density, we get a relatively low countering magnetic field from the electrons and relatively high effective magnetic field felt by the nuclei. Now here's the cool thing about this. All this affects the precession frequency and the frequency of light absorbed, right? D-shielded nuclei with low electron density absorb relatively high frequency RF radiation. They're over here on the right hand side of this graph where because the effective magnetic field felt by the nuclei is relatively high, this energy gap is relatively high and the frequency of radio wave light absorbed is relatively high. Shielded nuclei on the other hand are over here. They have relatively low effective magnetic field felt and so a relatively small gap between their alpha and beta spin states and they absorb relatively low frequency RF radiation. So you can imagine we could scan different frequencies and look for particular absorptions and protons or hydrogens more generally in different chemical environments. Different electronic environments are going to display different NMR frequencies and NMR precession frequencies. And so the NMR spectrum then is basically a plot of intensity of resonance, we might call that I on the y-axis, as a function of the effective magnetic field felt by the nuclei. Now again, for historical and practical reasons associated with how NMR spectra are actually measured, on the left-hand side of the x-axis, we generally have D-shielded hydrogens with a relatively large effective magnetic field felt by the nuclei, while on the right-hand side we have relatively small effective magnetic field felt by the nuclei. These are shielded protons that absorb relatively low frequency RF radiation. And on the left, we have these deshielded protons with low electron density. So just to give sort of a, a rough example here, we generally would expect CH protons and like alkanes to show up on the right-hand side of an NMR spectrum, they're relatively shielded since carbon is not very electronegative. But if you look at something like HF, that's gonna show up way over here on the left since this electronegative fluorine atom is gonna pull a lot of electron density towards itself and leave this hydrogen relatively electron deficient. Right, if we think about the dipole moment in this bond, this H is gonna have a delta plus and the F a delta minus. And that delta plus leads to this precession frequency, or this NMR signal, we would say, showing up on the left-hand side of the NMR spectrum. And the broader lesson here is that if we consider things like electronegativity and other structural effects related to electron density, we can often make a good guess about shielding and where along the x-axis a particular hydrogen should appear based on a Lewis structure, based on, for example, the Lewis structure of a particular functional group, right? CH and alkanes, CH and alkenes, CH and alkynes show up at different frequencies. OH and NH show up at different frequencies. A lot of this boils down to electronegativity and considerations of electron density around the hydrogens in these functional groups.